Hello, let's read from the book What Britain Did to Nigeria, a, re- a book written by Mark Siolon. I'll be reading from chapter 9, page 119, titled The Southwest Invasion. Ever since Portuguese traders and travelers arrived at the city of Iko, in what is now southwestern Nigeria, the city has been the location of pivotal events in the country's history. It was Nigeria's first post-independence capital city, and it was also the first Nigerian city that Britain colonized. Its location on the Atlantic coast and its features crisscrossed by lakes and lagoons led to the Portuguese to refer to it as Lagos. Lakes. Lagos's importance to Britain has largely been ascribed to its it's been a major slave port on the so-called slave coast of West Africa, but it was also the gateway to inland areas around the River Niger, used by both missionaries and traders. In the 1850s, Lagos was a diverse city. The repatriation of Lagos to Lagos of emancipated slaves from Brazil and so-called Saros from Sierra Leone changed the city's linguistic, political, and religious dynamic. Many of the returnees from Brazil were educated, Roman Catholic, Portuguese-speaking, and had Portuguese names. The Saros were the Anglophone counterparts of the repatriated Brazilian slaves. Saros were also educated and Christian, both, but spoke English and had English names. The returnee slaves and Christian missionaries were not on good terms with the Oba king of Lagos, Kosoko, whom they portrayed to the British as a pro-slavery anti-Christian tyrant. The combined effort of lobbying by the missionaries, British businessmen who wanted to trade with the interland, and the returnees placed Kosoko in Britain's crosshairs, the usurper of Lagos. A succession disputes gave Britain an excellent opportunity to interfere in Lagos' inter- internal politics and remove Kosoko. The Oba of Benin to the east of Lagos had the right to select the Oba of Lagos. He chose Akintoye in 1841, but owing to the leadership disputes, Akintoye was deposed and expelled by his nephew Kosoko in 1845. Akintoye went into exile firstly at Abeokuta and later at Badagri, both close to Lagos, and kept trying to return, but Kosoko put a bounty on his head. The missionaries complained to the foreign office about Kosoko's hostility towards them and called him the usurper of Lagos. Akito realized that his best chance of getting his throne back was by allying himself with the British, who had his own who had their own grievances against Kosoko. The British consul for the Bight of Benin and Biafra, John B. Croft, met Akintoye and explained his assurance that if Britain restored him to the throne, he would at lost slavery in Lagos and admit missionaries and British businesses. On 20 November 1851, Beecroft and a British naval delegation met Kosoko, but he refused to sign a treaty abolishing slavery on the grounds that he was a vassal of the Oba of Benin, and he could not agree to the treaty without the Oba of Benin's consent, and unless the Oba signed first. The First Battle of Eko Five days after Beecroft returned with a, with a flotilla of British naval ships, commanded by Commander T.G. Forbes, around 6.15 a.m., HMS Bloodhound and four other ships entered Lagos Lagoon. When they arrived within a mile of Lagos, Kosoko's forces opened fire on them from both sides of the river. The British returned fire with cannon guns and while Kosoko's warriors fired muskets from behind the city wall. About 160 marine used canoes to get ashore but never got further than 300 yards inside Lagos. When the marines landed, Kosoko's forces drove them back with flanking fire as they tried to advance down the narrow streets and alleyways. Every time the British marines tried to advance or turn down a street, they were met with defenders brandishing guns and swords. After two of the party were killed and around 16 wounded, they retreated and set houses ablaze as they left. They fled back to their ships and the attack was aborted. After discovering that four British sailors had been killed and another 29 wounded during the field mission, Commodore H. 
Henry Bruce reprimanded Forbes for his extremely ill-advised decision to confront Kosoko without prior authorization. The Boxing Day rematch at Eko. On Christmas Eve, 1851, British naval officer met Akintoye's forces at a pre-agreed rendezvous point in preparation for his second invasion of Lagos. The British Navy gave white neckties to Akintoye's men as a distinguishing mark and one pound of bread, three days ration. In the early evening, HMS Bloodhound and HMS Teaser anchored out of range of Kosoko's guns. On Christmas Day, Kosoko's warriors rained musket fire on the British ships in a futile attempt to prevent the marines from landing. It was largely a wasteful exercise as the navy was out of range. Around 6 a.m. on 26 December 1851, the British Navy commenced their second invasion of Lagos. As the troops tried to get ashore, they had to run a gauntlet of heavy musket fire from Kosoko's warriors who had lined up behind the sandbanks along two mile stretch of coastline. The Marines managed to damage and prevent some of Kosoko's cannons from firing, but at a cost. Kosoko's men pounced on them with sword and killed or wounded 80 to 90 marines while they were trying to return to their lifeboats. Two men who were left behind were killed. Meanwhile, Beecroft was on board HMS Victoria when its anchor broke loose and the ship floated within range of fire from Kosoko's men. A spent shell hit Beecroft, then bounced on the ship's deck. To prevent the ship's gun from falling into enemy hand, Captain Lister led several men to board it and disable his gun. From 17.15 to 3 p.m. the next day, the British ships bombarded Lagos with constant cannon and rocket fire, which destroyed Kosoko's ammunition dump and the house of his deputy, Tapa. The detonation of ammunition sent some shells flying and caused much death and devastation. Vast areas of the city were set ablaze as the, fire, as the fire jumped from house to house. The terrifying sight of the explosion and the fire broke the resistance. Late that night, Kosoko evacuated the city with his supporters. Britain has disposed, deposed Kosoko, but in the process, about 15 men were killed in action while another 75 were wounded. At, 15, at 5 p.m. on Sunday, 28th December, Beecroft and Captain Jones were ashore to inspect the devastation. They found that Kosoko's men had built excellent military fortification for a lengthy battle. Beecroft said, Had an engineer from Woolwich been on the spot, it could not have been better planned. Strong stockade and ditches without, with trenches within, deep with their sleeping mats, fire, water, and provisions, and at every point an enfilading piece of ordnance. They must have used every energy and perseverance for an, for an attack. The beach was fenced with 15 yards, having 5 or 6 feet for canoes at a narrow entrance near Chief Takma's house. British marines were tempted to destroy the rest of the city, but refrained from doing so as they wanted to preserve some buildings for Akintoye. The next day, Beecroft and British Marines escorted Akintoye to the ruins of the place and restarted him, restate, restated him as Oba. Akintoye sent a town crier around the city to announce his restoration. On New Year's Day, 1852, the restated Oba boarded HMS Penelope and signed a treaty with Commodore Henry Bruce and Consul Beecroft that forbade slave trading in Lagos by Britain or Lagosians, as well as banning human sacrifice, allowing missionaries to freely proselytize and granting British business favored nation protection. In 1861, Britain declared Lagos as a British colony and thus began Britain's colonial acquisition of Nigeria. Lagos became a corridor that Britain used to project its influence inland, initially to the north and east of the city. Join me as I continue what happened as the British look to expand their territory to the east.